So um, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about experiential knowledge today. Um, I know that Tazari spends a lot of time with it and says a lot of things, but today we're actually going to talk about a lot of new sources. We're going to spend a lot of time with texts that he uses to support his argument on why this type of knowledge actually exists. Mm -hmm. So um, there are a few things and a few caveats he mentions and introduce and starts off this chapter with. Number one, this type of only given to a few type of people. It is real, it's a real thing, right? It's not something that's that's made up. Uh, it is divine, it is from Allah. And lastly, it is known through inspiration. Meaning the only way you can get this knowledge is through inspiration. It's not something that you can pick up and pick, get from, from a book and read. Any questions on any of these? Or any that are unclear? So when you say tangible? It's not real that it's something that's tangible. It's actual. Scientific it's, actual. it's not scientific per se, but it is something that happens. Like okay. this, is, this is a reality. Like a moment, situation, or like yes, okay. right. It's not. It's not something that is. Uh, it's not a hallucin, right? It's not. Um, you know, what I mean, give it to the few that it's the third. It's it's it's, it's 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 not. It, that's not what he means. It means that not everybody's blessed with it. Oh. So esoteric, it means that some people contain it. Like, nice. they, you know, what I mean, like they kind of hold it. But given to a few means that only, Allah only blesses it to a few. Now, a few is, is relative and subjective. Okay? Because does Allah give knowledge, even the other types of knowledge, even religious knowledge, does he give it to everyone? Forget experiential knowledge, just religious knowledge. Mm -hmm. Does everybody get it? Mm -hmm. No, right? And so even that can arguably be said that it's given to, given to a few. Mm -hmm. True. And, and I wanted to, like, the thing about how that knowledge comes to you is something that you can't necessarily grab. Like even your understanding of things that are quote real, uh -huh. to some extent, you have to allow to give you that insight to understand it. You know what I mean? Is that just thing too far? Yeah, you no. Know, so the, the thing is, it's it's not just a fact. Is is knowledge quantifiable? No. Right? Can can you say like a person has X amount of knowledge? People have tried, mm -hmm. and they and how do they try? They say, okay, well he's memorized X Y Z. You know what I mean? But you still don't know. Wait, is, the, is that reflective of knowledge or is, is that reflective of how much information you can actually retain? Yeah. Or recall. Right? Or, you, or recall. You, you, don't, yeah. stuff you don't know, you know. And you know what's interesting? Later on in the chapter, Ghazali actually talks about knowledge being understanding. Mm. Un understanding is even more abstract. Uh, right? Yeah. How much does a person understand? Yeah. How do you judge that? Yeah. How do you quantify that? Your yeah. Huh? Through my quizzes. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 you know, and that's one of it for sure. Right? Because that event is late to the game. If only you knew about my quizzes. Oh, well, yes, man. <laughs> so, so the thing is, it, it is something that is definitely very much uh, abstract. It's and, and just like this is abstract, just because a person has been given inspiration. Does it mean that he'll be consistently given inspiration? No. Right? And even the types of inspiration we hear about, all they do is they add to his yadim. Mm -hmm. They don't add to a substantial knowledge base for something that he necessarily pass on. Mm -hmm. does, that, does, that, uh, does that make sense? It's, mm -hmm. we, we'll, I mean, we'll talk about the types of manifestations of how this knowledge manifests. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. And I think um, these are too quick here again. All right, here. So proofs of its existence. And he mentions two major types. He says tradition is one. Mm -hmm. when, when we say tradition, what do we mean? As far as um, types of knowledge, right? So he said, no, he's using proofs. He's saying there are proofs that this type of knowledge exists. And he said there are two proofs. One proof is tradition. So tradition is like passed on um, knowledge. what does it mean? The Islamic tradition. What Islamic is law, law, law. Law. So it would be the Quran, mm -hmm. Sunnah, and maybe statements of some of the mm -hmm. right? 
But in general, we're talking about the Quran and the and the Sunnah. The second one is experience. So this experience can be personal or it can be the experience of others. So there are a few verses that he mentions here. But we shall be sure to guide our ways, those who strive hard for our cause. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهُ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبُ That God will make a way out for those who are mindful of Him. He will provide for them in an unexpected source. He also says, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِن تَتَّقُوا اللَّهُ يَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ فُرْقَانًا وَيُكَفِّرْ عَنْكُمْ سَيِّئَاتِكُمْ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلِ الْعَظِيمِ That believers, if you remain mindful of God, have taqwa of Him, He will give you a criteria, the Qur'an, and wipe out your bad deeds and forgive you. Allah's favor is great indeed. So what I want to do with these verses is I want to look at them in context. And I want you guys to see, did Ghazali use these contextually or did he use them as silos and take out portions of a verse to justify his argument. You guys got your phones? You got access to Quran apps? Yeah. I want to see what y'all got. <laughs> and I want you guys to read the entire verse when we get to it. And I want to see if contextually what he says, can it be used to justify what his, his argument, what he said? Do, do any of us deny that experiential knowledge exists? No. 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 The only thing we're arguing here is, did Ghazali use these verses appropriately to justify his argument and its existence or not? So let's see what you're Okay, I mean, look up the translation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, I don't know how to Google. Oh, okay. Just, okay, just type it up. Oh, oh in the context of the verse. In the context of the verse. Right. Does it apply to what you're saying or not? Okay. Let's see what you're saying. Continuous I can, I can help you guys a little more. Uh, what's it? Uh, let's see. All right. So, 29 versus 69. 69, yep, 29, 69 is the first one. That's for those who strive hard. So, let's look at the verse before and look at the verse after to make sure that we're reading it contextually. And do the same thing for the second, the same thing for the third. Is the first work or does it not work? Who does more wrong than he who invents a lie against Allah or denies the truth? Mm -hmm. As for those who strive hard. My cause, we will throw the diaper into our car. Hmm. It's not the same thing. What do you guys think? 60 years and 30. What kind of guidance is it you think he's talking about here? Or that Allah is talking about here based on the context of the verse? Mm -hmm. Allah says in the previous verse, that who could be more wicked than the person who invents lies about God or denies the truth when it comes to him? Is hell not the home for the disbelievers? But we shall be sure to guide to our ways those who strive hard for our cause. God is with those who do good. Does this is this a proof of the existence of experiential knowledge? Yeah, I think it's I think it's a good proof. Yeah, I think it's a point. Yeah, uh, it's even two minutes. No, it's like one minute to be that long. Must yes. You good? Yeah. All right. I I, I, don't, I think we can put a check. We can put a check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dave, what do you guys think about the second one? Second verse. Second verse. Is no, no. You, we're about to come across something about the 
take away this is beautiful work. It is. This is the story of my life. This that. is a tunnel? This is mine? Uh, yes. Okay. No, it's not. It's not? It's not. It's not. Uh, it, this is in. Yeah, it is. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, this tool is really. Okay. Why are you coming down? Why are you coming down? It's 65. First, I mean, uh, Surah 65 versus 1 to. Just to, give, just to give context. Yeah. Oh, God, it's a lot of When you're divorced. When you divorce women, the wash gonna have to be done. Yeah, this this ties. This ties? This ties? Yes. Only in the first part. How does this tie in with experiential knowledge? Well, because time privileges is this verse is actually giving the instruction that previously wasn't this wasn't an injunction, it wasn't like a practice. Mm -hmm. Um and the worst one and the worst one I did. So it's like it's telling them how to how to act out uh, of all this practice. Okay. This, this is something that you could, I mean. Well, it fits because it's reiterated, kind of, right? Okay. okay. How's, how's that? It? How's that? Well, towards the end of the first ayah, it says, Allah's from Bible says, and whoever transgresses the limits of Allah and certainly wrongs himself. You know not perhaps a lot of things about after that thing. Right? Okay. And then it says, and when they have you know, fulfilled their time, either they came in according to set their terms or cut their time according to set their time. So then it says, is this is in there? It's in there first? And then to the institute, just to manage their mind, they want to slash the place for them if they be accepted to the law. That is instructed to whoever should believe in the law of law of fame, and whoever fears the law will make. Him yeah, you know, perhaps a lot of things about after that that doesn't matter, and for the people who are in for him or the other. What is this in the context of uh, in general? This verse in particular? Oh, wow. How so far is it? You know, how to do marriage? It's how to deal with marriage. Yeah, right? How, how to deal with marriage. Can it apply more openly and more universally? I think it can. But this is a less time of that I meant to give this as an example, mm -hmm. right? And we'll, but why use marriage as an example of this? Out of all the situations we face in our life, this is usually the most stressful one, right? The issue of divorce and marriage. Mm -hmm. So Allah uses the most stressful one, the most, you know, the tightest one, mm -hmm. you know, versus all of the other social and financial and spiritual ties that we have in this mm -hmm. world. Marriage is the tightest one, right? It, this, this is the one that when you talk about people talk, you know, the, the restructuring of families, mm -hmm. It's, it's through marriage and through divorce. Mm -hmm. So Allah will provide an unexpected source for them. They're mindful of him. This really has to do with, this is Allah addressing women, mainly, mm -hmm. saying that don't worry about the divorce. You are, you're obligated to what? Mm -hmm. You're obligated to have taqwa. You're obligated to have taqwa. And if you have taqwa throughout this entire divorce process, then Allah will make a way out. He'll make a way out. Mm. He'll make a way out. Because it's more stressful for her than it is for the for the man. Right? Because the man, he he has the financial power and he has the power of divorcing. Mm -hmm. Right? Versus the woman. The woman is in, in a uh, relatively weaker position. Mm -hmm. Because she he was his character. He was her character. So he mentions this is problematic. Um Ghazali, he says that this it can be problematic. This can be an issue. Why? If you look at this verse by itself in isolation, that verse that will make a way out for those who, who have taqwa. It's basically if we restructure this verse a little bit, we say Allah makes a way out for those who have taqwa of Him. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it it could create a problem for someone who's purely focused on the third. Okay. That is not. All right. That's not so I, I see think what I, I think Ghazali is coming at it from a different perspective, but I see what you're saying, where you're you're completely materialistically yeah. focused and you're only worried about your material harm. 
Yeah. Okay. So you're like, well, that means I'm gonna get another. Yeah. Man. Yeah. You may not get another man. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's possible, right? So that that's one. Thing. <laughs> what is what is the other problem that Lazadi is indicating here? If you take this verse in isolation. Oh. So he, he's saying that Allah knows best that you don't have to act, you don't have to do anything. Yeah. Right? You don't need to actually strive. The only thing you need to do is have taqwa. have taqwa. And he's saying that this is problematic if that understanding is the one that you take away from it. Mm. Ah, okay, I see that. Right? Like because you can't just have, you know what I mean? Just quote unquote having taqwa, that is not enough. You also need to you have need to act, you yeah. need to strive. Like so, this last the last verse. This one, I think this one is super clean. I, I don't think this one. Uh, right, I don't, I don't think this one requires. Uh, th this one, this whole entire verse is very clear. I don't, I don't think this requires too much uh, exploration on it. Is it contextually appropriate? Or not? So he says, that he'll give you, and, and Ghazali mentions this too. It'll remove you from the awful situation. Mm. Because once you develop that criteria, those things that have become gray to you again, this is something that is a personal. Yeah. To you, they, they will have become clear. Clear. Yeah. They'll become clear at that point. Mm. Any questions? Mm. So Ghazali also mentions that there is a hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he says, "Allah give me light and increase me in light." And you have talked about the importance of the metaphor of light previously. What does light represent in the Quran and the Sunnah? Generally. Oh, no, that's a valid question. Knowledge? Okay, it can represent knowledge. What else? Um. Right. Yeah. Said generally, when Allah talks about light in the Quran, he means what? He means Iman. Iman. He means Buddha. Because the, it is the Iman that is going to help you what? Differentiate between right yeah. and wrong. Yeah. Um, Where it says guidance. Guide, also, guidance. That, all, that also applies to. So guidance, iman, right? All of these things, yaqeen, right? Yaqeen, uh, certainty. All of these are representative of light. And Allah, the Prophet says in this hadith, Bukhari Muslim, that he constantly asks for light. He's asking Allah for light. And in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he says in another verse, um, oh, here. Afaman sharah Allah sadra hul in Islam. What about the one whose heart or chest Allah has opened in devotion to him? So he talks about this opening of the chest. It's not, it's not, it's it's opening it to what? To the light. To, to the light. Mm. Right? It's opening our chest up to receive as a receptacle of that light of that iman. Mm. So when you ask that Allah opens up those who are who? And he is upon light. And this individual whose whose chest is open, whose heart is open, he is upon that. Who Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wa fahu alamu min Rabbi." He's on light from His Lord. Yeah. So th these verses are very clear. They're very clear. Um, who it is? Those who mention Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that are allowed this. Life. They're given this. Life. They're given this iman. They're given this yakin. They're given this fuqan. They're given this criteria. Mm -hmm. And then Allah sent out another verse. Allah uh, nazzala ahsan al hadith kitaban mutashabiha. Mutashabiha matani. And he says here, God has set down the most beautiful of all teachings, a scripture that is consistent and draws comparisons, that causes the skins of those in awe of their Lord to shiver. Mm -hmm. Then their skins and their hearts soften at the mention of Allah. At the mention of Allah, such is Allah's guidance. He guides with it whoever He will. No one can guide those who Allah leads astray. 
This verse is very powerful, they're very appropriate. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about this nul. And remember, what is Ghazali using these to represent? Why is he using these verses? Okay, these are tradition, but what is he, what is the point he's trying to make? They're clear. Hmm. These are uh, these are things, this these are this information is uh information that you acquired from Allah. Okay. This is a proof that these are proofs he's using to tell us, like, hey, there is a such thing as experiential knowledge. Mm -hmm. And these verses prove it. Mm -hmm. These verses prove it. And when it comes to this verse here, the Prophet asks, was asked very specifically about Shaf Shafsa. He's asking very he's asked very specifically, what does it mean to widen or expand the shafts? And he explains it here. Right? He gives me, when Allah, he asks Allah to give me light and increase me in light, increase me in the light that we were talking about, right? In Iman, in the Then he says, and this is hadith here, uh, in Tabidi, fear the insight of the believer. And it the of the mu'min, for he sees with the light of Allah. Well, you can differentiate, right? Uh, so you start learning to differentiate. Mm -hmm. And when, when, you, when you put light on something, I mean, it's, it's just a beautiful uh, metaphor. When you put light on something, what happens? It's clear. It's clear. You, yeah. you can see exactly what you're looking at. And this is what Iman does. And this is what, this is what experiential knowledge is supposed to do. This is what religious knowledge is supposed to do. It casts light on those things which are not. And when you have light on those things, it puts clarity and it helps you make a decision. It makes your pathway clear and it helps you move forward. Mm -hmm. This hadith is actually not mentioned by the Zadi. I added it in because I find it so appropriate and so beautiful and I'm kind of upset that you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I declare war against him. I'll give you guys a minute to read it. Go, go. My slave does not draw me to me with anything dear to me. And what I have made obligatory for him. My slave continues to draw me to me by doing super obligatory deeds until I love him. When I love him, I become his hearing, with which he hears his sight, with which he sees his hand, with which he strikes, and his foot with which he walks. Were he to ask me for something, I will surely give it to him. And were he to seek refuge with me, I will surely grant him refuge. I do not hesitate to do anything as I hesitate to take the soul of the believer. For he hates death, and I. It's a beautiful hadith, right? It's a beautiful hadith. I, I really, I really love this hadith. And like I said, I, I wish Lozani had put it in, and because he didn't, I'm out of it. <laughs> but it, it really gives us, it gives us an idea, and it gives us a depth of understanding of how far this mood actually is, and how much it can pervade us to the point where everything we do is with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala's awareness, mm -hmm. right? With the taqwa, of Allah. So again, this I really you know enjoy this, and I, I like I like the fact that you know we, we have these hadith here that talk about the importance of the light, and this hadith here I'm just sharing because I feel this is the actual effect of that light. Mm -hmm. So he he mentions two ways to prove that there is experiential knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. And one of those ways we said is tradition. The other way we said was experience. So we have, for example, the companions and the followers of, and those people that succeeded them and followed them. So for Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr, he said to Aisha, he said to Aisha, he said, she is your sister. His, nobody knew his wife was pregnant. And he, he passed away very shortly after that. His wife eventually gave birth to a baby, a baby girl. Alma, this is a very famous story. He was giving khutbah and he looked over and he saw the enemy descending on the Muslims. Mm -hmm. And he yelled out to the commander of the Muslims, who is like in another continent, mm -hmm. saying, Yes, I need to He says, He says, Look to the mountain. Look to the mountain. They're coming to attack you. And they ended up winning and having a victory. Mm -hmm. How did these things happen? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them this information. He gave them this knowledge, and they were able to have these insights. 
Uh, in in Bhagavad study, he actually tells us and informs us that there are a number of miracles that happen to an, a lot of the armies. So what happened was that they were trying to cross a river, they were unable to, so they took Allah's name. And they actually walked on the river to cross it. And they said the only thing we lost was a goblet, like a, a goblet of a, a, a cup because it had fallen into the river. Otherwise, the entire army made it across without a shirt on problem. And then you have uh, you have a number of scholars and you have a number of Sufi masters who experience these things. And Hazali gives a lot of stories, right? He gives a lot of stories about what happened to different people and what happened to different things. What does he? Why does he mention them? And how come he mentions so many? Hmm. Different. Okay, the different stories to, to show us the different types of ilham that happened in Kashmir. Good. What else? Just to show that it's it's it doesn't that it doesn't occur to only one individual. Uh, to, to show us that it happens to uh, multiple people, right? Mm -hmm. And the more examples he gives, the more he's trying to prove his point through experience, right? right? And sharing with us, like, okay, no, it happened to him. Mm -hmm. It also happened to him. It also happened to him. No, you know, so he has this whole like there are pages you know, where he goes and he just lists all the examples that happen to all of these different people to prove that it actually does happen. Mm -hmm. That is his only purpose. His purpose isn't for us to what? To seek it. To seek it. Mm -hmm. How do we know that? How do we know that's not what he intended? Did not see franchises. Mm -hmm. Not the experience, the time. Awesome. You mentioned the previous. Mm -hmm. Re remember, the, the thing I had, I always point out about Ghazali is that he always builds, right? Mm -hmm. he, he orders his arguments very well. Mm -hmm. And whenever you look at things like this, you cannot just take them like this and, and say, oh, oh, this is what it is. No, no. If you look at everything that precedes this, you'll understand exactly what he was thinking mm -hmm. and why he intended the way that he did. So that's something that's very fundamental, something that's very important. Also, the things that they did, he doesn't mean for us to, to imitate that. Mm -hmm. Because again, we had also mentioned this before, and Ghazali talks about this, that the way that an individual goes and seeks Allah is what? It's individual. So however those people did it, that is the way that works for them. It doesn't mean that those are examples that you need to follow or ways that you need to imitate. Um, so that's why he mentioned. Also, what is the purpose of this? What is the, what is the purpose of this and this and what happened to these people? What is the reasoning behind? It? Is it to give us examples? Was that the purpose of those of those miracles? And who does and, and look at the people who Allah is giving miracles to? Just to believers. Okay, he's giving them to believers. Yeah. Okay. And? But I'm saying for me, as an observer, when I see a miracle, what is the miracle for me? For, for you? As, as, the observer, the as, 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 as the observer. It just shows the potential that you yourself have. Okay, maybe my personal potential, but what if Allah doesn't give me that miracle that He gave him? He can give you better, or He can give you better, no equal, or not. No. Right? Because ultimately, ultimately, what? That miracle is a gift. And Allah, like we said, He gives it to whoever He wills, whenever He wills, however He wills. Also, for me as an observer, is that miracle meant to increase my iman? Yes. Like, yes or no? Yes and no. Okay. If it's somebody who needs such a thing to increase your faith, uh, then yes. What kind of person needs miracles to increase their faith? Those are struggling with their faith. Those are very weak people. Mm -hmm. But for the person who the miracle happens to, what level is he at? Yeah. He's already there. Yeah. Does it really affect him? No, not really. Not really. Mm -hmm. 
right? He recognizes that this is a gift from Allah. Mm. But he's already at a status where this doesn't really make that much of a difference. Mm. So the one is that, which is for the Abiyah, the Karamat that happened, like the miracles that happened to the righteous people, those are meant for the righteous people. Mm. They're not meant for the, for the observer. Mm. Because the observer, what does he or she need to do? To be consistent. Uh, they need to be consistent with whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. Remember, because that laid down, he laid down the, the ground. Mm -hmm. Right? He already said what? You have to do your obligations, mm -hmm. and you have, to, you have to do your sunnah, you have to spend time with Allah, right? Mm -hmm. He says you have these are all the things that you need to do. And then maybe mm -hmm. you receive these gifts. Allah will give you a miracle. Hey. Is he getting a miracle? Oh, that's whatever. That's that's his business. Mm -hmm. Huh? It's not, it's not for me, that's his business. Mm -hmm. Because that is his personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you have the people who rely on miracles, what happens? Right? You just keep looking for the next miracle. Yeah. And that is kind of blinding you from the objective, right. which is what's bringing Allah. Well, I, I said, right? You're, you're getting that right. Not just that. Are righteous people the only ones who do miracles? No. no. Yeah. The judge. You have the judge, like the judge, he does miracles. Magicians, they do miracles, right? They, it'll appear like they're flying or they'll feel like they're doing. So this person, every time he observes something, I'm sorry, every time he observes something or every time he sees something, what is he going to do? He's just going to be like the wind. Mm -hmm. You know, some days he might be with this person, other days he might be with that person. Mm -hmm. So th this is, a, I mean, this is a problem, this is an issue. When we seek, we have to make sure that we are seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, that is the ultimate fault. As for what he's doing or what she's doing, that's none of my business. It's not my problem. He or she might, his miracle might be related to me, right? Like over here, this was related to Aisha. This was related to the army. There might be a relationship there, but it's not something that I should rely on. Because ultimately, our tawakkul and our reliance should be on Allah So, it, another interesting thing here that Ghazali mentions in this chapter is about that, is about understanding. And he meant, he actually uses understanding as hikmah, and he uses understanding as real true end. He doesn't, how many times has he talked about memorization in the entirety of this? Has he talked about it at all? No. That shows us how important it is to him. Mm. He doesn't even mention it. Mm. He doesn't even talk about it. He constantly talks about hikmah. He constantly talks about faham. Like even here, the ayah that he uses, right? Uh, that he talks about guidance as a type of understanding. Guidance. Mm. And he also talks about Right? That and we made Sulaiman understand the case. Right? He said, Fam. Though we gave sound judgment and knowledge to both of them, he's talking about that with us. So over here, it's really Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even stresses hidayah, stresses hikmah, stresses ilm, all of these fam understanding, because those are the issues that need to be focused on. And this is where true ilm manifests itself. Mm -hmm. Understanding. In, in understanding. Mm -hmm. In understanding. And one of the ways we understand, because it's it's clear what happens in these situations. You know, a person who's reached that level, they've reached that iman, they've reached that yaqeen, and it is meant to reinforce people who are already at that stage. Mm -hmm. Right? It's a reinforcement. Do you, you think Abu Bakr built his iman off the fact that he knew his mother, his wife was going to have a daughter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even Amr, did his anything change when he told he found out that the army actually heard him? No, he was already there. Like he's already at a, a, a level of yaqeen where things like this, all they do is they reinforce the yaqeen. Mm -hmm. Like it's not like, okay, oh man, like is there a law? Like, yes, I it's a jab. Oh man, this is amazing. Right? It, it didn't, <laughs> that's, that's not how it was. He was already a wedding. You know, these individuals are already oh yeah. And Allah gives them these miracles to reinforce their already strong belief. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that I think that's something that's really important to, to understand and take away. Um, so over here, Abu Darda, he mentions that the believer sees with the light of Allah behind a thin veil. 
basically that veil with which he sees with is Allah's name. And, and we were just talking about this uh, before you came in. What is the importance of light? It casts and it shows us the reality, right? Mm -hmm. When I put a flashlight on something, what happens? You just want to see the actual thing. Right, I can see the, I can actually see it, mm -hmm. right? If it was in the dark, I can't see anything. Mm -hmm. So with this light, I can see the pathway. I can see if things are right or wrong. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the amazing thing about this light is this light is, again, is individual. Mm -hmm. So Allah will give his light to you. Allah will give his light to me. Allah will give his light to other people. But sometimes the things that we see are different. They're different. Mm -hmm. But all of them are from Allah. All of them from Allah. Allah meaning that they're all right. So, and that is something that is amazing about Islam. That you can have one question and you can have multiple right answers. Mm -hmm. When people talk about the Madaha and different sort of things, it's okay. This is what Allah guided them to. And this is what is correct. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it might not be correct to me, but it's definitely correct to him. Mm -hmm. And that's all that matters. Because this is deep. This is what I draw near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I, I thought that was a, a nice, nice thing. And over here, this is a nice, this is a nice statement too. I don't know if you guys know uh, uh, any. Then the woman, Quran, like sorcery, sorcery, like the the one or the um, the doubts uh -huh. of the of the believer. It, it's a type of uh, it's a type of sorcery. Mm -hmm. Sorcery. Yeah. Why is that? The doubt of believer is a type of sorcery. The tricks because it's, there's no way of knowing its source, like you know, it, it's so it's so out of nowhere, right? A person doesn't need any of these things, and all of a sudden, he's like, Yeah, I don't think you should make that deal. Oh, I understand, right? Or a person might be like, Yeah, I don't think we should go there. I mean, yeah. what, what, like, what, where do you base this? No, where do you base it? <laughs> no, I mean, I don't, I, I, just don't I, I just don't feel it's a, you know, it's a good one, uh -huh. like, or I. All of a sudden, you know, you're, you're getting ready to marry, blah, 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 and all of a sudden, one day, like you're making a scar, you're making a step I don't think this is a good idea. Mm. Right? And uh, Allah, where did it come from? Well, it came from Allah. Mm. Right? It came from Allah. You were inspired to do that. And later you found out this was a situation, or this is what happened, and this was a problem, or whatever, you know, whatever. Mm. So, uh, I, 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 thought, I thought this was. I like that. Uh, I like that. <laughs> so how do they manifest? How do these things happen? They can happen in the dream states. They can happen while you're awake, just like happened with uh, with Omar Gilalan, right? Or you can see a dream that you saw something, something is going to happen or something will happen. So Allah allows these things to happen in different states. Sometimes you see about doing a, a certain uh, du'a or making a certain type of dhikr, right? You might get inspired to do that, or you might see something happening in the future, or you, you know what I mean, or some type of you might receive some type of warning. Mm -hmm. All of these are from. Mm -hmm. How do I know something is from Shaytan? Something looks good. Uh, somebody comes to me in white clothing, telling me this is what you need to do. How do I know it's wrong? If it's inconsistent with the Quran, it's ah, yeah. right. If it's inconsistent with the Sharia, mm -hmm. if it goes against the Sharia, then automatically I know this is from Shaytan. There's no way that this is wrong. Because Allah would never uh, inspire me to do something against his deen. Mm -hmm. So sometimes we might see things and it might look nice and it might look tempting, but just know that this is Shaytan playing with us, making us think that you know what we have is right. I mean, and, and this happens with uh, you know a lot of people who claim there are people who claim prophethood and they really believe it. There are people who, who believe like you know they're they're the new coming, or they believe they're the Mahdi. And they believe it, like they believe it. Believe it. Mm -hmm. Shaitan, oh, well, he tricks others. Huh? What about? I don't, I don't know. I don't know all. There's so many stories. I don't know all of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, this was a nice statement that I pulled out. This again. This is really much my desire. So he says the heart is like a pavilion which has been pitched. So a pavilion is, is like a house, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a house which has been prepared, right? And in this preparation, oops, uh, around which are closed doors. So it's like a house with, with all of these doors that are closed. 
and whatever door is open, that is the one that influences it. Mm -hmm. That could be anything. It could be positive or negative. It could be negative. So what are some of these doors? Um, he said there are some doors that are open for it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, and they, how are they open? They're open through mujahid, through striving against our nafs, striving against our, ourself. You know, in, in those uh, those evil thoughts, they're open through what? They're open through piety and being pious, trying to avoid things, even though we might know that they're halal. Um, shunning the sword. Shunning the sword. And, and what, what I mean by this, because not because they're halal, we're avoiding them, but because we fear for ourselves that this will lead us down a path that will harm us. Mm. Not overindulging? Yeah, we fear, okay, this is something that I will overindulge in. Therefore, even though it's halal, I myself am going to avoid it. Oh, avoid, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, shunning this world. And not shunning it in the sense that, okay, I'm going to completely abandon it. Shunning it, what does that mean? It doesn't own me. Uh, it doesn't own me, right? It doesn't control all my thoughts and all my decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay, Alhamdulillah, this is awesome. I thought, I thought this thing was going crazy. But, but he, he talks about opening the door. If you want to open your heart toward Allah, if you want to open these doors, these are the things that need to be done. An individual needs to strive. An individual needs to show piety. An individual needs to shun this world. And, and again, all of these things, they're, they're very practical. It's, he's not asking, you know what I mean? Sometimes we think of the soul as this like, you know, really esoteric, you have to submit yourself completely and you have to totally, no, that's not what's intended. You can still, I can live my life and still do these things, yes or no? Yeah. I can have any type of professional life and I can still do these things. And the beauty of Islam and the beauty of the system is that anyone can become a wali. Just like anyone can become a scholar, anyone can become a wali, and you have the potential, you have the tools, you have the pathway for it. This, this religion is not just for me, it's not just for a specific group of people or a specific person. No, this, alhamdulillah, is for everyone. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this is the, this is basically the end of the chapter, inshallah, for next week, we'll start a new chapter. But uh, you guys have questions before we close today. Or are any, are there any questions on the Zoom? Yeah, there is some, I think there's one. Okay. Can, can, can this thing necessarily give you access to the, to the doors of the heart? I'm sorry? Can these things necessarily cause, um, can they actually necessarily give you the doors to the heart? Because I can act all pious. Yes. But in reality, am I pious? Uh, so the thing is, there's false piety. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if it's false piety, then what am I striving against? Mm. False piety is just feeding my nuts. So, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, like I said, it's a very, it's a very logical system so. that, that he's put here. But he's saying that an individual who, who strives, an individual who strives, what is he actually, he's striving against his nafs. Mm -hmm. He's striving toward Allah's time with that. And if he's doing that, this piety that he's doing is real, right? He's, he intends it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and finally, sharing this word. Okay, I have questions. Uh, go, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not at the computer, so you're, I'll just- oh, okay. Oh, okay, so are you able to hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you, alhamdulillah. Oh, Okay, so my question is, um, in Islam, there's a concept where if you like keep doing, continue doing sins, then your heart um, darkens and becomes more black. So um, if your heart becomes more um, really black at that point, um, what can happen to your heart? Um, do you just turn away from the remembrance of Allah? So we had talked about this earlier. It's in one of the earlier classes on the way that the heart actually steers away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of those ways is sins and disobedience. So what happens is when an individual is actively sinning, we said that this person is in a state of, you guys remember? Ghafla. Oh, ghafla, mm. right? And why you have the opposite of ghafla is what? The dhikr. The dhikr, right? So the opposite of ghafla, ghafla is basically busying oneself or being distracted and dhikr is remembrance. Allah. So But uh, if, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay. So.
So basically what happens for an individual who is in a state of ghafla or the one who is sinning, that he doesn't remember Allah or she doesn't remember Allah. But we do have an opportunity to always cleanse our heart. There's there's nothing that in this system or in the in our Islam that doesn't allow us or prevents us from turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does, does that help clarify a little bit? Like the person is busy at the time. But it doesn't mean that he or she doesn't have the opportunity to turn back. Yes, thank you, Jazakallah Khair. Oh, how do you differentiate between dhal and waswasa? That's a good question. So, um, waswasa is, it usually has to do with ibadah, and it usually has to do with more personal issues. Um, no, I can't tell you this, but it usually has to do with like things that are related to worship or it involves the other people. So, and, and you'll see them consistently. So if I if I constantly think I don't have wudu, for example, or if I constantly feel I didn't pray, or if I constantly every person I come across I have bad you know bad thoughts about him, that is what's there, There's no doubt about it. You know? But the, the difference between one and what's what's is is far more continuous, right? It's, it's far more, far more regular, and you'll find it in many aspects of your life. Versus one, right? Versus having doubt or suspicion. Suspicion or doubt will be very. It'll be very specifically placed. It'll be very specifically placed. Does that uh, does that help, Jawad? Shaykh and how do you remove the wasps of that consistently coming back all the time? Oh, how do you remove waswasa? Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's a very good question. So waswasa are two types. You have spiritual waswasa, mm. and you actually have people who have mental health issues mm -hmm. in that that waswasa as well. So the the way to remove the spiritual one is to develop a more positive attitude, mm -hmm. meaning that I should have more hope in Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, meaning that I should trust in Allah more, meaning that I should have a better understanding of how Allah intended certain things for me and how he intends good for me. Mm -hmm. And if I believe Allah intends good for me, slowly you'll find that those waswasa will, they start decreasing. Mm -hmm. Or waswasa, was, I'm sorry. Uh, they, they'll start decreasing. Um, because many times the person who has waswasa, they're, they're constantly being put in doubt about their, their actions and their performance. Mm -hmm. Have trust in Allah. And because the reality is Allah is not petty. Right, a lot. He's not sitting and waiting for us to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Right, he just wants us to do good. He wants us to act, and he wants us to make that effort. Mm -hmm. And if we understand that, then we should be able to move forward. You know, I've had I've had a lot of people like, in in Subhanallah, in Bahara purification especially, and you have a lot of us. Also. You have people like, you know, I feel something when I stand up after, you know, when I go to pray, or you know, like, okay, I, I still see sprinkles on, you know, on my clothes, or I still, you know, what I mean, or I, I felt like I walked in this, or I don't feel the bathroom is good. All of those things, Allah is willing to overlook. Mm -hmm. The Prophet some overlooked them. He, is going to, he's willing to overlook them as well because he showed us in his Prophet that he overlooked them. So it's it's very important to kind of you know keep those things in mind. You know, making adhkar, uh, making dua to Allah to remove them, having yani husnul billah, having positive thoughts in Allah subhanahu wa taala. These are all ways to remove the spiritual waswasat or wasawas. As for the, those individuals who suffer from anxiety and mental health issues, you know, depression, et cetera, uh, you, you'll need to speak to a counselor, right? You know, speaking to a counselor, I, I believe most of those cases can be dealt with just therapy without medication. And I think there are some cases, extreme cases that do require medication mm. and, and not, not to cure them per se, but to bring them to a point where they can actually even have conversation mm. because there are some people who are just so engrossed in that and so, uh, I, what's the word I'm looking for? They're they're so they're so infected with it that they can't even bring themselves to a stage where they can even have you know a conversation. Mm -hmm. But there are some medications that can actually bring them to the point where their their hormones and chemicals are balanced enough where they can actually sit down and talk, and that can kind of help them through the way. So you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all, yeah. protect yeah. our families and children. I mean, uh, yeah, go ahead, Nadia. So can what's supposed to be something uncontrollable because? I just remember this, I don't know if it's a hadith, but I remember the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they once came to the Prophet um, telling him how they had uh, thoughts about Allah that they were ashamed of. I don't remember the exact hadith. I don't know if you um, recall, but 
um, is that something natural or is it? Um, so what what's what's the shaitan and meaning it, it's it's unrestricted, right? Shaitan, he who does he choose? He chooses everyone, right? There's <laughs> there's there's no one like all right, you know, all right, yeah, this guy I'm gonna leave him alone. No, <laughs> he 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 chooses everyone. There's nobody who's like beyond his scope. So the waswasa will come to anyone and it will come to everyone and it'll come in different forms, right? So some people will be more affected by certain wasawas versus others. Um, and, and again, that's on the spiritual level. Uh, in terms of like mental health, there are some people who suffer from it and there, alhamdulillah, there are some people who don't. And like I said, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that. Mm-hmm. But, but when it comes to the shaitan, it's, he's, it's unrestricted. Allah calls him our enemy and he, he truly is our enemy. Experience does not equate to understanding or, or wisdom. No. But experience does reinforce. Uh, yes, it, experience will reinforce understanding. That's a, that's a very good way to put it. That's a very good way to put it. That experience doesn't replace understanding, but experience will reinforce understanding. Okay. Uh, I guess if we don't have any other questions, it's almost time for Iqamah. So we will stop, inshallah, and I will see all of you next week.